Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue with verse two, verses 242 and 243, which read as follows. Malitya ducharitang Macherang dadato malang Malawi papaka dhamma Asming loke paramhicha Tato mala malatarang Avinja paramang malang Etang malang pahantwana Nimalahota pikavo Which means Evil conduct is a blemish on a woman. Stinginess is a blemish on a giver. Evil deeds indeed are blemishes in this world and the next. But beyond these blemishes, more blemishing or more of a blemish, malatarang, is ignorance, the ultimate blemish. Abandoning this blemish, be without blemish, bhikkhus. So this verse was taught in response to a story about a woman, which is why it references that, I guess. We don't know the woman's name, we don't know the man's name, but there was a man who lived in Savati, I think, and married a woman. And the woman was quite unfaithful to the man. So we hear. And the man found out and was quite embarrassed and was embarrassed to show his face in society. It seemed like, a, I guess it's a social stigma to have been cheated upon. But eventually the Buddha found out and, and he was talking to the Buddha and he told the Buddha what had happened and how devastated he was. And the Buddha reminded him something that, well, it sounds very prejudiced against women. He said he talked about the evils of women and how they're unreliable and undependable and unpredictable. Basically, how they they are, they will cheat on you, that sort of thing. And then he taught this verse. Well, he taught a, a, a story, a Jataka story, as he often does when we sort of skip those. The main gist of the story is you can't depend on, on women, basically. So I don't want to get distracted by that, but just to address it briefly, it's common in the Buddha's teachings to, to reference women um, because quite often, most often, he was talking to heterosexual males or, or males in general and was describing to them n not with women particularly in mind but the, with the objects of one's attraction in mind so if you talk to a, a man who is lusting after women about how unfaithful men can be or how unpredictable they can be it, it really has no purpose and so this part is a practical teaching it's just something that one should remind oneself of. And the basic teaching, which is much more useful in modern times, in times when our audience is much less restricted to the male gender, the, the main basic teaching is that you can't depend on the objects of your desire. They're not going to always satisfy you. You're not going to always be able to depend upon them. Most especially when they have sentience, 
when you, when you depend on people, whether they be friends or lovers. There's no sense that men are any better. And so the teaching that we should give to all people is that you can't depend on people, especially people who are blinded by lust. Romance is such a crapshoot because of that. Not only are people undependable or uh, unable to, unreliable, but people who are uh, caught up in lustful desires, which is like a fire that spreads from one thing to another, are doubly unreliable because of the lust. So if you go into romance thinking that you're going to be able to have a reliable, dependable object of to satisfy your desire, it's kind of like depending on a forest fire to keep you warm. There is no reliability, there is no dependability, there is no containing it. Not your own lust, not the lust of others, even one's own lust. It's very easy to find oneself caught up in um, extra marital or extra relationship uh, affairs so people who do commit adultery or do break their commitments who do cheat on others and by cheat it really means uh, to mislead and, and to uh, betray someone's trust you know if you have an open relationship with someone Polygamy isn't really considered a bad thing besides the uh, intense lust that it involves generally. Um, but going behind someone's back is its a betrayal of trust and, and so it creates suffering, of course. There's, not, there's something particularly devastating of having your trust uh, betrayed. And so that's the lesson of the, of the story, I think. It's not the main lesson of the verse. The, the, the great thing about this verse, and why I think it is a really great verse, is that it puts things in perspective. Like quite often the Buddha does, and especially with these stories, because the stories often are about trivialities. It's not trivial for someone to cheat on someone else, but it's not ultimately important either. And so the Buddha says in the verse, he, 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 the way he phrases it is, these are bad things. And he purposefully, I think, pairs someone cheating on someone else with something fairly mundane, which is being stingy when you give a gift. They're totally unrelated, but it puts them on par. And if someone is devastated or angry or vindictive about someone else cheating on them, they should really put it in perspective. What did you expect? You expected the forest fire not to burn the fire not to burn the forest down? That's basically it. So the 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 first verse says that these are bad things, and it says these bad things, and, and any bad things, papaka dhamma, these are blemishes. You know, we talk about well, one, I think, mundane, in a worldly sense, interesting thing about choosing to talk about women and blemishes is because society generally has placed a high importance on the beauty of a woman. You know, when you talk about beauty, we're much less inclined or concerned with the beauty of a man. We aren't completely, but women, the, the fixation on a woman's beauty, especially for men, is pretty incredible in society. And women are treated as sex objects and so on. Makeup is important. You can't... I talked to women... Uh, one woman in university and she explained it to me that she didn't like wearing high heels but if she didn't wear high heels she wouldn't be taken seriously it's quite impressive the the, the degree to which we women especially are required and and so the point being that with beauty being so highly uh, esteemed 
One thing the Buddha is doing here is pointing out what is a real blemish. It's not a lack of physical beauty or attractiveness, which of course is subject to the whims of society, but if we talk about beauty in general, saw a person's beauty, the Buddha again and quite often says, what really makes someone beautiful is purity, purity of mind. And so someone who behaves immorally, unrighteously, unethically, that's where the real ugliness comes from. It's an important lesson, important reminder. It's an important teaching of the Buddha. As to the second part, I don't think it, it requires much uh, explanation, but it is an important teaching. It's not the main teaching of the verse, but charity is a very good thing. Again, pairing it with, with the first part about uh, women and immoral conduct and so on, is putting these things on a level because these are not two important thing, important doctrinal uh, teachings. Giving gifts is a great thing, but it's a mundane thing. Or maybe there's no but, just a reminder that it is a very good mundane thing. So if you want to support for your practice, well, these are the two parts, really. The Buddha is putting these two things together, ethics and charity. They're the two sides of the coin. What you shouldn't do is all these unethical things. What you should do is good things. Help others, be kind to others, be generous. And it is an important, it points out an important general teaching that it's the quality of mind when you do things that's important. So when we're talking about charity as an example, charity is quite powerful, not because of the amount that you give to someone or the person, not, not especially the person you're giving to, but your state of mind. If you give to someone who it's, who, who, who's worthy of, of a gift, it's going to give you a better state of mind, of course. But ultimately, if you're giving a gift reluctantly or or regretfully or offhandedly it has very little effect or very little benefit but giving gifts is an example of something that has benefit asming loke paramicha in this world and the next and the buddha intentionally i think reminds us about that about it being related to this world and the next not in a positive sense, in a limiting sense. Because something, something that has benefit in this life, of course, from a Buddhist perspective, isn't that impressive. Suppose you are kind to people, generous to people, ethical. People will like you. People will trust you. Good people will respect you. You'll incline or gravitate towards good people. They will gravitate towards you. People who are not so good will, will want to have nothing to do with you or... Maybe they'll want to take advantage of you, but with strength of mind and purity of mind, you can free yourself from so much trouble in this world. But so what? This life is going to be over soon. This life doesn't last very long. So then you say, well, but not just this world, but the next world. But the next world also. How long is it going to last? How long can you keep it up? before you change and fall, if you've seen others fall into bad ways and you shift all the way to the other side, which is evil deeds. Mala ve papaka dhamma asming loke paramicha. Evil deeds indeed are a blemish in this life and the next. They they put a, a they corrupt our quality of life in this life and they set us up for Ugliness in, the, in future lives Physical but more importantly mental Ugliness But the limiting factor is that that's not in, That's not ultimately Important What's much more important Is to understand that And to understand that Any good thing you do Or any evil thing you do Has an effect But is limited in its effect, it doesn't doom you, it doesn't save you. It's 
not something you can be complacent about or not something you can feel hopeless about, should feel hopeless about. It's the nature of reality. And that is the lesson of this verse. And that is the most important part of his teaching, the second verse. Beyond all these bad things, which are bad things, acknowledged in this life and the next, they are going to hurt you. Much, much worse is one thing, one thing that really compromises the Comprises, or comprises the core of the Buddha's teaching, and that is avijja. Avijja pachaya sankara, the Buddha taught in Paticca Samuppada. Ignorance leads to all sorts of formations, all sorts of creations. It leads to the world, it leads to the universe. It's what creates our life and our future, our happiness and our suffering. It's what determines our fate. Ignorance is the greatest stain. And this is, it's not obvious, and it's not a foregone conclusion. There are many religious teachings which place uh, faith as the highest goal, and so doubt in teachings. It's so foreign to Buddhism, but... Well, there, there even are Buddhist traditions that call themselves Buddhist that say the same sort of thing, that complete faith is the greatest purification or the greatest quality of mind. That if someone has even the slightest doubt in the Buddha, and that is the greatest blemish. That's the greatest evil. That's what's going to doom one. And so one has to put perfect faith. But... That's not Buddhism. That's not the teachings of the Buddha. There's no way that that was what the Buddha taught. What is exceptional about the Buddha and, and quite different from the majority of religious teachings is that the Buddha focused on wisdom, rija, understanding, knowledge. And why that is, why it's, I think, quite uncommon to have a religious teaching that, that focuses so intensely and so specifically and in so much detail on understanding and wisdom above and beyond everything else, above goodness. And why it's so rare is because it's so difficult. It's because it is the ultimate. You can't teach it if you don't have it. You can, it's just very difficult. You can't teach wisdom if you don't have wisdom because you're going to be called out on it. How could you teach something if you don't understand it yourself? How could you claim something like, like ignorance uh, as being the worst if you don't have an understanding of what it means to be ignorant or an understanding of the things that we are ignorant of? It's a much more powerful thing than goodness or, or faith or even purity of mind. Because there are states of purity that are, are unrelated to clarity, are unrelated to or sorry, unrelated to knowledge and wisdom. So let's talk about ignorance. What is ignorance? It's important to understand what the Buddha meant by this. He's talking about the worst thing. And so clearly he doesn't mean ignorance in the cap knowledge of the capital of France or the periodic table of the elements. He's not talking about science or general knowledge. He's talking about a specific type of ignorance. Specifically, what is suffering? What is the cause of suffering? What is the cessation of suffering? And what is the path that leads to the cessation of suffering? If you're not familiar with the Buddhist teaching, it might seem a little bit arbitrary or specific, oddly specific. But if you have some 
knowledge or if you take the time to gain some knowledge about the Buddhist teaching, some theory, you start to get a sense of how it could be just the most important thing and how it really is that which ignorance of causes great suffering or causes all of the problems in the world. Because if you talk about what causes problems, what is the problem, what is the most important, it all relates to happiness and suffering. It doesn't relate to knowledge of how to split an atom, or knowledge of how many stars there are in the universe. It doesn't relate to supercomputers or worldly acquisitions. relates to happiness and suffering. And so we, we are ignorant of those things that lead to suffering. We're ignorant of those things that are suffering, meaning there are many things that we cling to or crave for without realizing that they're not going to satisfy us. And without that clear knowledge, We'll always crave for the wrong things, we'll always strive for the wrong things. Based on our ignorance, we'll do all sorts of things that end up causing us suffering. That is really the key point. Too many times, too often, we focus on solving problems, changing things, brute force, forcing things to be better, basically. We, have, we take it as a foregone conclusion, what is right. You know, if if only I were without this, or if only I had this, then I would be happy. We fail to take the time to understand what truly causes suffering and, and, and leads to happiness. And it's completely missing the point. This is an important point, that we focus in the wrong, sp in the wrong place. We think of ourselves as acting to fix and to change ourselves, others, the world around us. When in fact all of that is dependent completely on our inclination, on our state of mind, on our understanding, our level of understanding. The, the, the understanding we have of how the world works, what is good, what is bad, what is right and what is wrong. When pain comes up in the body, to use a very simple example, we, we take it as a foregone conclusion that removing the pain will solve my problem. Completely wrong. Completely unfounded. Pain isn't something you can control. It isn't something you can predict. It isn't something you can run away from. And And yet, based on our understanding that pain is the cause of suffering or pain is suffering we can't help but act in such a way that is going to remove the pain and the only way to change that is not to suddenly decide you're not going to do it it's to create the understanding that pain isn't actually the problem to create the understanding that you can't actually run away from pain and there's no benefit in trying that is what is meant by ignorance that is what is meant by ignorance being the most uh, dangerous, the most problematic. What is ignorance? Why, why, are, why ignorance? Why are we ignorant? We're ignorant because our minds are not clear. Clarity of mind is the practice. Again, I said that it's possible to have states of mind that are clear and are pure, but don't relate to wisdom. But without the clarity, without having that clarity, the application on those things that are that we are ignorant about um, bears no fruit. We can't gain from it. We can't benefit. We can't learn from our mistakes without clarity of mind. 
So it's not to say that just having a clear mind is sufficient. Again, that's not wisdom. That's not what frees us from ignorance. But the reason we are ignorant is because when we apply our mind to our experiences, to our lives, to our reality, we do it with a clouded mind. So let under, this is important. Understand that meditation isn't about running away from your experiences or, or maybe more... more uh, comfortably put Leaving behind or, or rising above your experience It's about engaging with your experiences In a new way In a way that is pure That is clear That is objective That is wise That is based on knowledge and wisdom Why are, we, why are we ignorant? We're ignorant because our minds are unclear. How do we become free from ignorant, ignorance? Well, quite simply, by, by purifying our minds, but we free ourselves from ignorance by seeing the objects of reality as they are. We, we free ourselves from ignorance by cultivating understanding. Again, by applying our minds in a new way, but by dedicating our intentions, by, by our attention, focusing our intention on understanding. And I phrase it like this because it is in multiple parts. It's not just sit down and meditate and understanding will come. The Buddha wisely separated wisdom out into three parts. We want to apply our minds in the right way, but how do you do that if you don't have, first of all, simple, mundane, intellectual knowledge? We shouldn't discard or discount intellectual knowledge. If you don't take the time to learn how to practice Many people It's quite a Quite a, um, quite a common problem uh, A perspective that people have That meditation is meditation And if you close your eyes and sit down Good things will happen Maybe you don't quite know what those are But the fruits of meditation will come to you Because you're meditating Nothing can be further from the truth Closing your eyes doesn't do anything Except prevent you from seeing Sitting down just generally brings pain Or, or pleasure It's a physical thing And so learning how to meditate Is in many ways as important as meditate Well, in, in the beginning for sure and yes, it is, I suppose, even more important than actually meditating. That's maybe not fair, but without it, you can't ever be expected to meditate properly without learning how. It is possible for, for someone of great, great perfection and, and highness of mind to figure it out for themselves. The Buddha did. But 99.9 but .9 times out of 100 People who try to do that fail We're not very special If you are very special, well congratulations But most likely you're not It's much more common for people to think they are And we should be very careful About thinking we're special Could be If you are, power to you I, I applaud you If you're not Take the time to learn from someone who is Someone like the Buddha Don't feel bad I'm never going to be the most special person in the world Probably neither are you And that's okay That's not the goal That's not of any consequence Except for the fact that you need to then go out of your way To learn from someone who is So we learn the Buddha's teachings This is an important thing to do It's of course not enough And it, it's also very common for people to To rest on their laurels once they've done that if you did learn how to meditate, I mean, more often, if you did learn much of the Buddha's teachings and never got into meditation, you'd be useless. The Buddha said, like someone who looks after the cows of others, 
They don't get the milk from the cows. But nonetheless, an important part of the process. And the second part, of course, is just to internalize the teachings. And the Buddha talked about someone who has lap wisdom. Some, something like lap wisdom. Lap wisdom means you keep it when you're sitting sitting down, like something on your lap. It's there. You're able to hold on to it. But when you stand up, where's your lap? It's gone. And all the stuff on your lap falls off. If you had something sitting on your lap, like your bowl, it would fall to the ground and break. And he said some people are like that. They listen and they learn, but they don't appreciate. They don't... They <clears throat> They don't take the time to appreciate the teachings. And so the second aspect of gaining understanding, of directing our minds properly, is to take the time to understand how to practice. Really, most simply, this means translating words you read or words you hear into your experiences. Because when you receive them, there, there's a level on which, there's a stage at which it's on the intellectual level. You understand the concepts, but you don't connect it with your experience here and now. What am I doing? If I talk to you about body and mind, you have to take the next step to, to, to re relate that to my body, my mind my pain so I can sit here and teach you about pain but I can also be uh, troubled by my own pain and, and shifting and so on and not being mindful of my own pain it's very easy to make it all intellectual where it doesn't become a part of your experience here and now here and now we have suffering we have ignorance all of these things that the Buddha talked about the Buddha taught are here and now. Then really the second type of wisdom is this translation, translating teachings into experience, into perspective and approach to our own experience. The third type of wisdom, or the third aspect of wisdom, of course, the most important, is to actually gain this understanding for ourselves of what the nature of reality is. And this is what we do through meditation. We cultivate clarity of mind through reminding ourselves of the objective, mundane, simple, pure nature of our experiences by saying, for example, pain, pain, or thinking, or rising, falling, liking, disliking, and so on. And by, by, by creating that clarity, in relation to the things that we are ignorant about, the things that we cling to as good or bad, me, mine. We not only have this pure and, and pleasant and peaceful state of mind, but we have the capacity to see more clearly and to understand more clearly what it is that's causing us suffering. And that's what it's all about. What are the things and the actions and the inclinations that are going to cause us suffering, that do cause us suffering? And what are those that are not? They're very simple questions that can be answered with very simple practices. But we have no clue. We have no understanding of this. We're born without understanding of this. We're not born with a clean slate, pure. We're born with ignorance. And more importantly, we're born with many uh, inclinations based on that ignorance. We're taught to be ignorant. We're, we're, taught, through, we're taught ignorantly. We're not taught to try to understand things, to try to see things clearly. We're taught to chase after things. We're taught to cultivate biases against and for things. Our biases are reinforced by our parents, by our society. And it's just simple biases, like when we cry, our parents try to comfort us. 
teaching us that when you're upset, fix it. When you're unhappy, find happiness. Don't spend time focused on the unhappiness. When you want something, go after it. We're taught to like and enjoy things. Children are taught to play, which play has its value, but much more fundamentally, play involves craving, involves liking, involves enjoyment. It involve, I mean, involves um, attachment to things. So we're taught these things, and, and there's nothing, this isn't a condemnation, this is just the nature of reality, the nature of life. It's just the way life goes. And so it's very unnatural or, or abnormal for us to even think about trying to understand things. We spend all our lives with very intimate connection to all of the truth of life. All of the things that are important are right here And we know very little about them We know very little that's important or that's useful About pain, about suffering About happiness, about craving These things that are, should be so familiar to us Are like foreign, are like alien Because we don't ever take the time We don't ever approach our experience with clarity of mind, with, with objectivity. When you lust, as I said, it lust blinds the mind. When you're angry, you can't hope to see clearly. When you're tired from your exertion and your ambition, when you're distracted, worried, restless, when you're confused, all of these things cloud the mind. Prevent the mind from seeing clearly We have no inclination to try and see clearly We have no intention to It's not what we're taught It's not what we see as important We're totally ignorant Not, even, not just about the nature of reality but, but even about why it would be important To try and understand reality Avinja paramang malang very core, core, core teaching of the Buddha. Ignorance is the greatest blemish. And then the most important point, maybe even more important point, if you free yourself from ignorance, etang malang pahantwana nimala hota bhikkhu. If you give up this blemish, You'll be free from blemish Give this one up and you'll be free from blemishes And then you might ask Well, but what about all the other blemishes? How can you say that if you give this one up You'll be blemish free? Because No other blemish, no other evil Could ever stand without ignorance Avijja Pachaya Sankara Avijja Pachaya Avijja is the beginning of the whole causal chain that creates suffering That creates problems for us in life Without ignorance at a very basic level We could never get angry We could never crave for things We could never be biased or Afraid or worried or frustrated or depressed Without, any of, without ignorance we couldn't have any of these things And that is not an obvious teaching That is not something that should be obvious It should be, if you've never heard these sorts of things It should be a bit of a surprise It should be something you look at with skepticism Because it doesn't sound familiar It should be a new teaching A new idea And so it's important for us to hear this And to internalize it And then to practice it Once we understand it to, in, to incline ourselves To focus our intention, attention On the acquisition of knowledge, wisdom, understanding Not intellectual knowledge Though it's important for practical purposes But the understanding 
of the nature of things as they are, of our experiences, mundane things like pain, like thoughts, like emotions, like physical experiences. Not to gain one specific understanding or some specific understanding that can be put into words, but to approach and to engage with, real with reality from a, an understanding perspective, a perspective of understanding. So that when you feel pain, you understand the pain. Your, your, perspe <clears throat> your perspective on pain is wise, is one of understanding. I know pain. It's not surprising or shocking or unexpected. It's not good, it's not bad, it's pain, and I know what pain is. And that knowledge, that understanding, which has nothing to do with books or intellect, that frees you from any kind of suffering from the pain. And the same goes with everything else, with our memories, our thoughts about the future. It goes for our friends and our lovers and our family. It goes for our future and our past, this world and the next. Ignorance is the greatest blemish. Free yourself from that and you'll be free from all sorts of blemish. So that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for listening.